Uh, welcome to the Omohundro Institute Summer Series on Slavery and Freedom in the Era of Revolutions. I'm Karen Wolf, the Executive Director of the Omohundro Institute and Professor of History at William & Mary. I want to tell you a quick note here about storms. Um, many of you know that we're experiencing quite some storm activity on the East Coast where all of us who are producing and participating in this event are located, although we're stretched a little bit up and down the coast, um, and it may be that we lose some functionality, one or more of us. If you see us suddenly, one of us go quiet, exactly. You see one of us go quiet, you know the others will step in and take over um, and do our best. Um, but I ask you to just uh, be patient with us. So this series um, is really exciting, I think. It brings together scholars for casual conversation about deeply important subjects. In the first week, we heard from Christopher Brown and Paul Polgar about abolitionism in the early US and the UK. And then in the second week of this uh, series, we heard from Anisha Sinha and Mike McDonnell about black radicalism. And on August 10th next week, we're gonna hear from Annette Gordon-Reed and Rob Parkinson about race and patriotism. And I'm going to introduce uh, tonight's conversationalists. I'm so excited to hear them in just a moment, but I'm gonna remind you a little bit about um, why throughout this series, we're gonna be talking about uh, historiography and why we're deep, digging deep on historiography. Historiography is the ongoing writing of history by historians. It's about how historians respond to one another's research, how we integrate new information, new methods, new perspectives. And we think historiography is just as important for public audiences as it is for specialists. That's part of why we've made scholarship open to read via a list of recommended readings. I'm gonna put that link in the chat shortly in case you haven't um, visited that list. Um, the list was launched to accompany an event at the New York Times on slavery in the American Revolution associated with the 1619 Project, and we also have a special list created for tonight, um, and I'll put that in the chat too. And message me on Twitter if you'd like to send us, uh, if you'd like me to send you a historiography is lit sticker. They're pretty awesome. I can guarantee that I've been sending them out. It's quite a joy in this time to be sending and receiving mail. So you can message me on Twitter, um, or you can send us an email at oieahc at wm.edu. Two more things. We'll have a Q&A starting at about 640. Please enter your questions in the Q&A on the bottom of the screen. If we have something really pressing, we're gonna break into this conversation, but um, for the most part, we'll go after 640. We'll also keep the chat open, uh, but the Q&A is much easier for me to pull questions from. Last thing, you'll get a survey from us after the event, and we really appreciate you filling it out. We're doing a lot of work to keep improving our programs, and your feedback really helps us with that. Okay, so to our wonderful conversationalists on critical Caribbean contexts for slavery and freedom in the era of revolutions, Laurent Dubois and Natasha Lightfoot. And I am giving you just the briefest of introductions to these marvelous scholars. Laurent is professor of Romance Studies at Duke University, and he's the author or co-author or editor of about a gazillion works. I rounded up, but just a little. Um, his latest book is co-authored with my William & Mary colleague, Richard Turitz, Freedom Roots, Histories from the Caribbean, published by UNC Press in 2019. And his very first book, I'm just going to call it his best book, which won the 2005 Frederick Douglass Book Prize, is A Colony of Citizens, Revolution and Slave Emancipation in the French Caribbean, published by the Omohundro Institute with our partner, UNC Press. <laughs> Natasha Lightfoot is Associate Professor of History at Columbia University. Her first book, Troubling Freedom, Antigua and the Aftermath of British Emancipation was published by Duke University Press in 2015 and a special shout out to Duke for making that freely accessible associated with tonight's event. Thank you, Duke. Um, she's currently an ACLS fellow working on her book, Fugitive Cosmopolitans, Mobility and Freedom Struggles Among Black Atlantic Subjects. And she was also recently awarded, this is so cool, an Endangered Archives Program grant from the British Library for Digital Preservation at the Antigua and Barbuda uh, National Archives. So we are so delighted to have the two of you in conversation. And this is where I get the joy of stepping off here. And I'll come back in about 40 minutes for Q&A. So over to you two. So. Um, Laurent, should, do you want to start? Should I? <laughs> well, first, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, so much for the introduction. Natasha, it's so great to be here with you tonight. And we, we had started a conversation a few days ago that we're going to kind of continue. Um, but um, I think, yeah, why don't, why don't you begin? And we're uh, talking about, um, you know, we, we were thinking about starting about the what, kind of why we do what we do and the kind of origins of some of our projects. So, yeah. Um, so I, I think um, why we why I do what I do is you know very much um, both kind of tied to my personal history as well as um, some of the academic path I took 
from undergrad to graduate school. Um, so, you know, I'd say in undergrad, I was really interested in African American history, um, you know, did a lot of um, sort of the long arc um, and took obviously other courses on, you know, kind of comparative histories with other parts of the Americas, did Latin American history, did, you know, history of colonialism, um, things like that. But I ended up um, in graduate school um, through the sort of, um, you know, the wonderful fortune of um, ending up at NYU's African Diaspora Program. Um, and uh, at that very same time, you know, kind of, there were, there was a wonderful convergence of scholars in that program, um, asking um, students questions around, you know, sort of what is the making of the diaspora? How did we come to be in this part of the world? And, you know, obviously slavery was such a paramount part of the discussion, but I kept saying in all of my classes, wow, when are we going to get free? When do we get to free? <laughs> you know, and I just sort of, um, you know, kind of maybe got so focused on it to the point that I also became, you know, kind of like too much of a believer in it. <laughs> Um, you know, and so now I, I have a much more complicated sense after spending about 20 years of trying to work through what the meanings are of freedom and then to kind of put that, you know, kind of very brief, um, you know, story of my intellectual journey into the question of freedom with personal history. My family is, um, you know, from the West Indies on my mother's side. She descends entirely from Antigua until she came to the United States. Um, and on my father's side, there's all this leaping around from island to island. My grandfather, his father was from Barbados. His mother was from Dominica. Her mother was from Montserrat. So there's a lot of movement. Um, and then my father goes to New York as well. My parents come together, have me. I spent a lot of my childhood listening to stories of 20th century Antigua mm -hmm. and how, you know, Antigua and the rest of the British held Caribbean progressed to independence through a story of labor resistance and the creation of, um, you know, sort of the first trade unions that come into the region. And so I knew that that story very well. Um, it was sort of uh, very much about kind of how trade unionism and politics and, you know, sort of um, labor resistance converged into um, the making of what might be an incomplete, um, you know, sort of nationalism um, and failed federation as a pit stop on the way, right? So there's that story. And I kept wondering why the story never went back further um, and always wondered, well, what's going on in the 19th century? I, you know, I know so much about African American history by the time I get to college and, you know, haven't heard as much stories about enslavement and how that and, and, and sort of freedom and how those stories shape what becomes that 20th century um, you know, kind of uh, arc that I just traced that I, you know, kind of know from the personal stories. And so I kind of um, wed my questions about what did freedom look like with this sort of big kind of murky sense of what did, you know, sort of early Antigua look like. Um, and was led to, I began sort of thinking that I was going to do a later history when I started my dissertation uh, that became my first book. And so the last chapter in my book on the 1858 um, uprising was actually going to be the first chapter of my dissertation. And I was going to go forward to that same period of time that I was very much comfortable with. So it was going to start in 1858 and end maybe roughly around 1939, 1940 um, to sort of take me into those, um, you know, those labor rebellions. Um, and then somehow, uh, as I was doing, I, I discovered the 1858, um, you know, the existence of the 1858 um, uprising uh, just randomly while I was visiting Trinidad for Carnival in 2002. I just decided, while I'm in Trinidad, I should also go to the UE archives. <laughs> um, and so I'm in, you know, the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library at, um, at St. Augustine. And they had an almanac 
for the 19th century and mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle of that almanac and the almanac is really just telling you like events of note for all of the British held, um, you know, Caribbean in the 19th century. And so by year and by territory, you might hear about these different things. And of course, Antigua being small and sort of not quite, um, you know, the most prominent and the most lucrative of territories that usually tended in the 1600s to go to Jamaica and by the middle 1700s, I'm sorry, to Barbados and then by the 1700s to Jamaica. So, you know, sort of the primacy of those two islands in the historiography of the Caribbean is still pretty, um, you know, clear, right? Um, and then, you know, size, you know, kind of crop, things like that will determine when and where certain places, sometimes rebellion itself will, you know, kind of determine when and where certain other places come into view. Um, so Antigua doesn't <laughs> um, for quite some time. It's sort of like 1736 and then sort of nothing happens for a bit and then freedom happens and it's a little bit, you know, kind of, it sort of declines and then you don't hear much about anything else. But the Almanac happened to, to note that in 1858 there was this uprising of rabble rousers and the way that it was described is that it was something that involved people with no political design whatsoever. Um, even though the jails were really full. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. That has to be political. <laughs> that's exactly what is, you know, kind of, you know, kind of what colonial note-taking looks like, right? Mm -hmm. um, the this, this, this stuff of trio, um, the kind of idea that whatever politics that working people had, had to not exist, right? Um, so we'll get to trio in a second, obviously. Um, but the other thing that is really kind of remarkable is that once I found out about that, that event, I kept trying to figure out, well, why did that event happen? What was the genesis of a set of hundreds of people? And for Antigua, that's a big deal because Antigua has about, at the point of this uprising, maybe somewhere between 32 to 35,000 people. It's still very small now, but it's quite small then. And so, you know, four to 500 people in the street at any given time is kind of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much an earth shattering event. Um, and especially when they're in the street to express a certain kind of dissidence, I thought, well, we've got to figure out what the roots are of that. That sent me to asking the question of, well, what came before? And that becomes this question of freedom and how does freedom and the passage of a colonial um, you know, emancipation law do something to both change and yet still stabilize the inequities of the order that the British had been you know, putting in place since the 1600s in much of this part of the region. And so for me, um, I, talk, I talk a lot about how the the story is one of would be um, I don't I don't I don't know if it's would be revolution, but it's something maybe before that. Mm -hmm. Whatever um, you know, kind of is the seeds of that. Let's say, and the question of you know failure as instructive, um, because I think when you talk about. Um, sort of the Caribbean, you're looking so much at um, a number of attempts at overthrowing a system, overthrowing by announcing, um, you know, all of the demands for, um, for rights, for some sort of justice, um, reparatory justice, really, right? Um, so the, the question of how enslavement casts a, such a long shadow that it's still what people are rising up against. And one of the things that I found in my research is that this is true of every British territory, that there's some sort of post-slavery uprising that sort of, it just hops from place to place. And the immediate catalyst looks different. So in Dominica in 1844, it's census riots. In you know 1856 in Guyana, it's the Angel Gabriel riots and it's questions around Portuguese immigrants um, you know, who are putting, putting themselves forward a little bit further in terms of, um, you know, economic progress. It's Morant Bay, it's, it's in 1865, is sort of the big one, but it, there's one in St. Vincent, there's one at, you know, you can go on and on. So 
it's interesting to think about all of these as kind of stretching the early American revolutionary form into a very um, kind of, I guess, a, the, the sort of brainier, less clear texture of the later 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think we still have a lot more to go on that. But yeah, I'm so that's sort of the story of me. And I would say that so much of my personal autobiography is tied up in this, not just because it's Antigua and also because it's, you know, sort of the, the West Indies and the places that I'm, I'm sort of familiar with hearing, but it's also the labor stuff. Like my parents were union members in graduate school. I was a union organizer and I was on strike while the people I was writing about were on strike. And it was, so that it was all these interesting convergences around like kind of, you know, different ways that people, um, you know, in the sources, um, you know, kind of brought forth so much of my own personal journey um, as, you know, kind of a would-be scholar and a child of the, the Antigua slash Caribbean diaspora. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, so much of what we, we talked about this the other day as well, but this kind of idea that, right, that when I think of historiography or history writing, sometimes I think it's really, most importantly, it's about the future, right? It's kind of about, like, what futures are imaginable, what possibilities are imaginable. Um, I mean, it's obviously, and, it, and, it's, and it's always also about how we situate ourselves in our present vis-a-vis -vis those, those things. Um, it's interesting because I think at a similar kind of move from very, uh, for me, very present concerns. I mean, I actually went to graduate school at Michigan for an anthropology and history program, fully expecting to work in anthropology on basically contempor totally contemporary questions, right? And the questions that had brought me to Caribbean studies were essentially around the, the Haitian diaspora. The first work I did was about the kind of blaming of Haitians for AIDS in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of again, a political moment, a kind of political reaction to that, that then led me to try to research and understand it. And then I had done a, a, a senior thesis on contemporary Guadalupe. Um, and it's just interesting because what, what I um, ultimately came to, to what, what I originally thought what I, was gonna be a kind of contemporary in investigation of these kind of diasporic experiences um, with some historic information, you know, <laughs> flipped basically, right? And there's still actually a lot of uh, a work about monuments and contemporary Guadalupe in, in the book in the, in the Colony of Citizens. But, um, and one of the guides for me in that whole process was, um, so I also kind of arrived at Michigan at a, I think, a, you know, like you did at NYU, um, at a kind of particular moment of con configuration of people that includes. Sorry to interrupt, but I would like to say that there is a Michigan diaspora that came through NYU. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that also needs to be noted, right? Like the moments sort of, the, right, the right. Yeah, yeah. sort of, yeah, that, yeah, that's an interesting conversion. When I got to Michigan, sort of Ada was essentially the person, like she was like the people, the person we would all aspire to be someday. You know, she was like the great advanced, brilliant graduate student. <laughs> so still, still true, actually. <laughs> but, uh, and so she had, you know, kind of sh shaped a lot of that. And, and, you know, you did have those different generations that had a, um, but in particular, of course, Re Rebecca Scott, who had, who, who uh, Ada had worked with, and many other people. Um, but I was actually going to, I'm going to read a little something from uh, Fernando Coronel, who was my mentor at Michigan. Um, we published last year a, a collection of his essays that he passed away a few years ago. Um, because in a sense, he was the one who kind of helped me figure out that there's always this connection between the past and the present, right? And that, and figure out that there's a way in which, um, you know, writing this Caribbean past was also had to be informed by and dialogue with. Um, and we taught together, actually, my second year, we taught a course in Latin American history that he kind of invited me and other students to rewrite with the Caribbean at the center, you know, as a way of sort of saying, well, we, we can teach this as the Haitian revolution in the middle of this. Um, so he, in a, in a, and this, this connects a little bit, it will link up to what we, I think, wanted to talk about too, with regards to trio and, and, and silencing. And, um, but he has a piece called uh, Pieces for Anthro History, which um, we published in the Fernando Coronel Reader. It's, it's originally in a book called Anthro History. And he has this, uh, so forgive me, I, I'll read it as a little a paragraph, but I think it'll open up a lot of good questions. Um, and so it, it's essentially about, it's, it's, a, it's a piece in which he's sort of riffing on Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history, but kind of trying to think about, well, how do we place the Caribbean and Latin America in the center of our story, right? Um, so he writes, imagine a discussion about truth in a Jorge Luis Borges story 
written by Italo Calvino and illustrated by M.C. Escher. In a magnificent square called Paris 1945 to 2000, Jean-Paul Sartre, Claude Lévi-Strauss, and Jacques Derrida argue in French about how to best explain human history. Through a crack in its foundation, a path suddenly opens into a larger square called Europe, where Kant, Hegel, and Marx inanimately discuss the nature of universal history. Unbeknownst to all of them, Europe, their assumed center of world history, is located atop a grain of sand minutely drawn by William Blake's mind. Trapped in a convent built upon Aztec ruins located inside this granule, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz reflects on faith through Christian, Muslim, and Buddhist theologies. From one of the convent's secret doors, a labyrinthine past 100 years long leads us to an islet, Saint Domingue, 1791 to 1820, where the rebel Bukman, a slave who had learned from his African ancestors the power of spirits and plants, places his faith in Legba to battle for freedom. And he goes on, right, to talk about this Haitian revolution. From a telescope 10, 10 to 5, 500 n times more powerful than the Palomar Observatory, located in a star of another universe, we could retrace all their words and deeds backward or forward, floating as cosmic dust long after their authors died. And if we look for certain words with care, we may be able to find those brought together by Alejo Carpentier, an historical novel, read in that, that in that, a place called the kingdom of this world, where each individual life came to be valued as a precious universe, historical truth, was discovered to be fundamentally practical, a matter of struggling against the forces that limit life, the source and aim of history, an elusive marvel. <laughs> um, so what I love about that is partly that he's, there's a kind of way in which I think when thinking about the history of the Caribbean, there is always this movement between past and present, and also this kind of need to upend perspectives, right? Um, this kind of question of like how to fit this story into a, a world that doesn't have a place for this story, right? Um, where the national histories that dominate things don't have room for it, right? Um, and where even Caribbean nationalist historiographies struggle with the fact that, you know, sovereignty continues to be so constrained and limited, right? So I think as you were describing, right, the sense that whatever struggles came from the past, they're still unfinished, right? And, and whatever the, the situation is, it's not as if a, a, a kind of, you know, there's been a denouement <laughs> or a reaching of freedom. Rather, it's this perpetual cycle, right? This kind of sense that, you know, the 1938 uprisings are are building on the earlier ones, but also they that we keep having to fight, right? That there's this kind of sense of. Um, so I think it sounds like, you know, just to sort of to echo what you're saying, that's that's kind of what I discovered too is that that movement between the sense of kind of unfinished or unachieved political projects. And then the roots, trying to understand the roots of them is, is really so, you know, it's so much what drives, what drove, I think, Williams, Eric Williams and CLR James, you know, it's what drove Trio. It, it's what kind of is at the center. And it's, it's interesting because of the way, I think, having listened to the other conversations in the series, right, it does, it is sort of different than the kinds of burdens or questions that happen when people are writing more maybe with, in, in, in oriented towards U.S. history, right, or North American history. So it's kind of interesting, even though the questions about slavery and freedom and how they continue to, to burden the present um, are, so, are so alive still. Right. I think it's interesting to even um, sort of going back to the conversation we had prior to the conversation we're having now about the ways that so kind of juxtaposing um, the, 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 the history of the Caribbean to the history of the United States and how sort of the 1619 project and everything sort of surrounding um, even the sort of the slavery and capitalism turn seems to be about trying to establish, you know, the sort of the primacy of slavery as, you know, a kind of founding element of United States, um, you know, the, the United States as a, as a, as a, as a national project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for Caribbean history, that's sort of a given. There's, there's no need to sort of debate or prove that. I mean, you know, for, for, all, any, for all intents and purposes, you know, Eric Williams, CLR James before, um, you know, and ultimately, I mean, even for the U.S., the Du Bois before all of these people, mm -hmm. you know, kind of yeah. made this clear, right? So if we put, if we, if we lay out sort of a, you know, a Black radical tradition of historiography, um, that has always been, you know, focused on the importance of um, of slavery as a kind of, you know, critical element in the making of um, these profoundly unequal um, social structures. The nation state as a construct, as something profoundly violent, 
um, comes through this experience of enslavement as embodied and freedom as imperfect and unfinished, right? That, you know, that that's sort of a given and almost all of Caribbean historiography sort of, you comes know, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. comes out of these kinds also, of things. Like given like for, it's not just even national, it's just global, right? Like it's kind of like that's from our, our historiography, it's very grandiose, I guess, but it's sort of like, well, basically modern history, broadly spoke, speaking, at least in Europe, Africa, and the Americas, you know, exactly. and maybe more broadly is rooted in that, you know, and that, that, are, that the, the, everything is touched by it, right? So there's kind of, it's, I think that's really interesting how that perspective, that perspective infuses the arts, it infuses literature, it infuses history, you know, um, and it infuses political struggles too, right? That, yes. so that the point is that these political struggles are, you know, they're, they are, of course, remembering, you know, the extent to which, um, in, you know, in any kind of Haitian political, you know, dis, uh, discussion or demonstration, right? The history is evoked very centrally, very powerfully. Um, as unfinished, essentially, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think um, the same is, is true in a different way for the, the you know, the, the British um, Caribbean, um, because so much of what happens there is, you know, less of the sort of the, the war <laughs> that, yeah. you know, kind of marks the emergence of the Haitian nation state and more of the procedure, the tidy British process, the, the paperwork, <laughs> the commission. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it's literally that work that the British, you know, constantly did to oversee and micromanage this process was literally with Haiti in mind, right? It's that yeah. it's the point that, you know, Ada Ferrer's first book and in some ways her second book too, um, you know, and Rebecca Scott's book and, you know, again, a number of the Michigan diaspora folks make, right? That there is this, you know, that there is this real um, kind of fear and this ever-present spectacle of Haitian right. nation state formation as one that is, you know, undoubtedly unruly and black. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately creates the thing that everyone else in every other empire is trying to manage against. Right, and the sense that there, yeah, there's always this possibility that has to be shut down, right? I mean, yeah. I think so much of that colonial history, and of course, so much I think of the history in the US too, right, is about the, the possibilities that have to be headed off, that have to be, and it is, there, there is a way in which that, so the, it's that the revolutionary is, is always kind of latent. It's always kind of <laughs> lurking, it's always haunting so many decisions. And I think you're right, the British Caribbean, you know, whether it's how Trinidad evolves or all, each of these cases, it's always kind of like a, a, a chess match isn't quite, I don't know what the metaphor would be, but a kind of like, I guess like a spiral actually of like things kind of affecting each other um, in different parts of the Caribbean. And so you really do, and this we found when, when Richard and I were writing the, the, the Freedom Roots book, right? Is how much, how complex it is to conceive of the region, but also of course there's these kind of ongoing and struggles, and then also in each place, is, and the way that, you know, in your book, you so brilliantly show the way that, like, struggles of, of a mark over markets, struggles that are, like, deeply anchored in kind of land and production and gender yeah. um, structures, family, you know, then that there's, th these are all connected, right? And that kind of movement um, and that rootedness of these, of these very, very concrete struggles and the way that they then are kind of also always, like, these global struggles at the same time, right? Because they are facing off against the British Empire. They're facing off against a structure um, with these larger, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. I think almost, um, so, you know, in my book, I kept feeling like almost every chapter was um, another iteration of the same test, the mm -hmm. test that's, that's laid out, um, in, you know, the kind of, the test that Black people were always going to fail um, in, you know, this, the story of, Kind of transitioning from slavery to freedom. And I think um, the, you know, the Beyond Slavery volume that um, Cooper, uh, yeah. Fred Cooper, um, Rebecca Scott, and Thomas Holt put together really kind of, it's, it's such a thin but dense volume and it lays out so perfectly in, you know, this, this, these questions that all of their books um, individually also do, you know, to much, you know, kind of further, um, with further depth but that, but that Beyond Slavery volume does so much work in, in such few pages to say the test was always going to be a, something that Black people failed, right? right? Yeah. There is a way that the, the freedom that they were going to perform 
publicly was going to always be imperfect. <laughs> um, and that there might have been a window, right? And I think Holt's book argues for that sort of possibility. And I sort of, I still mull over that, whether or not, was it always an opening? Was it, a, was it a closure? <laughs> um, I, you know, and I could, that's the other thing I'm always um, thinking about is this idea that, you know, the empire was always testing black people with the expectation that they would not mm -hmm. perform freedom in the fashion that was required of them. Yeah. Um, and that was the reason why empire had to always be in place that literally, um, you know, this, the, that the revolutions proved it, right? That the would-be wars, the would-be, the failures proved it, the success of Haiti proved it. Everything sort of come, doubles back onto proving all of these empires right in their logic that, um, you know, that Black people were not going to ever find themselves in a place that um, granted them full personhood. So that these kinds of things had to not be kind of waited upon by the by the empire that that ultimately the stories I'm telling are of people just going out and trying to take that personhood for themselves because yeah. they knew they weren't getting it. Right. Um, not by an abolition act or any other act that was right. going to follow it. Um, so, you know, every chapter is them trying to, you know, sort of they, them encountering another version of the test them failing it, but them knowing that that was going to be the case and they're still gonna try to live regardless. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's partly right, it's that ever receding like horizon, right, that the yeah. empire offers, which is like, oh, maybe eventually you might possibly have some rights to citizenship and yet, yeah. but also then each form of resistance is taken to prove that that, that citizenship can't be granted as well. Um, and then at the same time, right, this other side of the story, which is that people are constituting these radical forms of, of selfhood, of citizenship, of rights, of, um, you know, that are not recognized really, and yet are being, you know, they're, they're sort of transforming, you know, how much they transform these landscapes of the Caribbean that are really just built to be plantation zones with laborers who are nothing but property into, you know, what is actually a radically different kind of space, a space obviously full of constraints, but yet, you know, the landscapes of the Caribbean themselves become um, over time, you know, for, so totally up, upend that project in a certain way, as do all the different forms of personhood, you know, that, that are also so, um, so vital in the cultural realms and legal, I mean, all kinds of realms that we can kind of see right. spreading it's out and existing diasporic it's, expressions. Yeah, it's all kinds of expressions of, of, of cultural personhood. It's, you know, there's so, there's so much kind of brimming um, mm -hmm. at the surface of the ways that people make and remake themselves both in slavery with us with an eye to freedom and in freedom with an eye to something like real freedom right, right. yes yeah true, true yeah. sovereignty or true freedom and yeah, yeah. The, you know and and again it goes back to the to the word that you used um that sums it all up that that the project is unfinished that mm -hmm. we're sort of still you know looking at a post um slavery post emancipation moment right that we're still experiencing these you know problems of freedom these problems that you know in various um you know kind of imperial spaces in the region the historiographies have laid out so yeah. Yeah. and why the memory and i think that's why you know we talked about this too but the kind of memory politics whether it's the monument discussions which you know for which there's a whole situation going on in the caribbean that's really fascinating you know and it has been going on for some time i mean i um, in, in A Colony of Citizens was writing about people building new monuments to, you know, sort of over getting rid of the, not so much getting rid of the earlier monuments, but making monuments to those who resisted uh, reestablishment of slavery in 1802 and so forth. And, um, you know, one of the, the, the monument to Solitude, who is a woman who fought, you know, who was, who was pregnant at the time, fought, fought the French in 1802, and there's a monument to her. And um, so it's kind of interesting how there's, all these echoes between obviously what's going on in the United States now and what's going on say in Bristol or other places and the way in which you know a lot of that do, does I think emerge actually from these kind of earlier Caribbean struggles or, or at least connected to it um, as well so. Right and um, I would even you know volunteer too that you know the sort of the CARICOM reparations struggle also, is another yeah. sort of um, reckoning with history in this way a kind of um,
you know, and it's, it might be again, an incomplete and sort of really difficult um, push. Um, not, and, and interestingly enough, for, for different reasons, obviously, than the reparations struggle in the United States. Um, because the United States is sort of dealing with having to convince, a, you know, kind of majority white nation that slavery mattered, mm -hmm. right? Similar to how we started our conversation in the historiography piece um, with the 1619 Project. There's this work now to convince, you know, lawmakers to care. Whereas in the, in the Caribbean, you've got mostly heads of state who descend from enslaved people. So that's not the issue. The issue is it's within this, you know, colonial framework where the deeds were done here and then the riches went to Europe. <laughs> and so with that, the question of what is owed is still kind of within this, you know, framework of having to negotiate and, you know, kind of demand from remote places that won't even acknowledge still that there was anything wrong with what was done and the, the rather um, obvious inequities between the sort of the economic fortunes of say in England or France and say, you know, the, the English speaking or the Francophone um, Caribbean at the present. Yeah. No, and I think those kinds of reckonings, I mean, it's a great example of the power of history, since when you read those reparations case, you're like, oh, this is capitalism and slavery, <laughs> like <laughs> turned into a legal brief, an international legal brief, you know. Um, but then the way in which I think that has led to a lot of reckoning in England now, right, sort of reckoning around indemnity and reckoning around, and it's, it's so interesting to see, you know, how much even, you know, obviously the taking down of the Colston statue, you know, and how much that kind of opens up all this this kind of long overdue reckoning obviously um similar to to in, in france as well so i think but in each of these connected cases right where the sort of the magnitude of it right which is sort of like this world built upon the slave trade um and all of the ways in which you know that kind of moment where people it is happening in europe and in the united states people are like wow there are monuments to white supremacists everywhere you know <laughs> and, and 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 people are like yeah that's kind of the point right that's sort of the right so right. Like right. you're, not, you're not like, getting history from those monuments so yeah, much you're exactly. getting a particular side of the story um yeah. you know it again to go back to trio how he parses in like the three faces of sans souci or um you know columbus and yeah yeah, yeah which who yeah i thought of that when colston you know but yeah that that narrative he has of, of throwing columbus into the sea my um, goodness and with Col days. columbus went into the sea a couple of times in the last couple of yeah. months <laughs> Um, and I guess maybe to, you know, good end um, to at least begin a conversation about history as opposed to sort of thinking and, and you know, sort of endowing these, you know, these, these pieces of stone with the power to actually educate, mm -hmm. which yeah. they don't, you know, they mostly obscure. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Laurent yeah. and Natasha, I've got some questions for you guys. Um, they're so, you've raised <laughs> so many deep and profound questions. I think what's exciting for folks who are listening to this conversation and clearly what's animating um, both of you is that these Caribbean contexts open up such profound, deep questions and issues. These are not, I mean, we said casual conversation about deep subjects and we have been talking about deep subjects, but you guys have really gone to the kind of nature of history, what animates um, historical inquiry actually <laughs> what historical movements mean, what power they have in the present, you're taking on all the big things. So not to, <laughs> so, um, so it's not surprising here that, um, that the questions do the same. And I'm gonna try to do justice to a question from um, Roseanne Adderley, which I think, um, Roseanne, you'll have to forgive me if I butcher this question, but I think this question is really about, um, do we always have to think about the Caribbean in terms of the foundational context of slavery? That is, is, can you think about a 20th century um, Caribbean um, history? Can you think about designing a course that doesn't have to begin with slavery um, mm -hmm. at, the, at the root? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because um, notably, in, again, in writing Freedom Roots, um, the, for instance, our chapter on indigenous, the indigenous Caribbean, for instance, right? Um, which the point of that chapter is that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continuing story, right? That it's not just a past story. It's about, you know, it goes up until today um, with different groups. But there's kind of, there are all of these stories, obviously, that are, um, 
you know, and, and I think I think that's that's vital, right? And that the plantation, while it dominates, is also only part of the story. Um, so I think at this, at, on one hand, I think that's a great, for me, it's a great question. It's also, it's true, it's interesting how difficult it is maybe to, to figure out how to do that. Um, but it's also true that um, the question, it, it, there's, or maybe another way to put it is that the question of freedom, sovereignty, liberty, um, is articulated in the Caribbean in all kinds of ways, and not only because of a dialectic with slavery, you know, but also for lots of other reasons, right? And so maybe that's part of, that would be part of the starting place, which is, um, it's not only a, you know, it's not only a refusal of what came before, it's also obviously a creative process, um, which has roots in all kinds of spaces, um, you know, in, in Africa or indigenous experiences or others um, that aren't always contained within slavery, right? Um, and I think that's, I did a translation recently of Jean Casimir's book, um, uh, which is coming out at UNC Press, and he's so f forceful on this point, right, about breaking our imaginary, if only just to sort of say, like, remember, um, the, the captives in Saint-Domingue never thought that, like, slavery was a legitimate thing. You know, they never believed that any of this made any sense. They, they had to deal with it, but for, as far as they were concerned, this was always a kind of absurd um, you know, proj uh, absurd situation they had been placed in uh, without any legitimacy, right? And I think that's an interesting point to, to, to make. Mm -hmm. it's so that, that last point you made is sort of, you know, um, the point that animates how I even, I teach about enslavement and, you know, teaching the Haitian revolution where you kind of don't want to get into that whirlwind of there would be no Haitian revolution without a French revolution. No, I think the embodied experience of enslavement taught them that this did not need to be happening, that this was absurd, that this was fundamentally wrong and at, at odds with their very clear sense of themselves as human beings, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with or without the language of, of the rights of man, they, you know, would have, there was always a freedom ethos in mind. Yeah. Um, but to get to this question, Roseanne, oh, you're trying to throw me off here with this one because I don't know how to answer that really smartly. Um, but that's because you're so smart, Roseanne. Um, so the idea of how to start, um, you know, chronologically outside of slavery is one thing, but conceptually is interesting because there's almost always, I don't, you know, I don't know if this is a good answer to the question, but I always wonder if, it's not latent in other discussions, um, you know, and and it's it's sometimes not it's sometimes not there. I mean, in how people sort of articulate what future they might be, you know, trying to push for. Say, I don't know if like, say for instance, the folks in the in the late 1930s in the British West Indies were literally, you know, kind of marshalling. The language of enslavement there, um, but I but I don't know if it's not always in dialogue, even when the language isn't there. And I am still, I'm 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 wondering if you know, kind of saying I don't. I think it would be lazy to just say, well, you start later in time, and then you're sort of dealing with different questions. I don't know if there's not always a conversation happening, and I don't know if that's a you know, kind of a problematic way to think about the the region or not. Um, but in many ways, a lot of the sort of the plantation society model, the kind of the building out from, um, you know, kind of that understanding of, of, of space and profit model into social stratification, into gender relations and, you know, sort of the formation of, um, you know, kind of, of household and around these labor roles that were forged through the violence of the plantation economy. I don't know how, I don't know how not to see it as sort of an ur text, uh, how not to see enslavement as something that's always there. But I, I think I, I want to stop because we have other questions, but <laughs> let's talk more. It's, I was just gonna it's such a, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it's such a deep question because I think it, it, what it asks is to take the empire out as an agent, and that's, yeah. that's really powerfully difficult. I want to, there's so many good questions here. I want to um, kind of combine a couple and ask you, um, 
about uh, about questions of women and indigenous people. Then, so there are a lot of questions here that are asking you about new directions in Caribbean history and new directions in Caribbean history that are about politics and power, slavery and freedom, and how do you engage histories of women and also not erase the histories of indigenous people within those? Um, do you see those as key to kind of new trends and new movements in the scholarship? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that the, there's been some really um, important feminist, black feminist interventions into the history of, um, of slavery in the Caribbean um, that I think are really sort of animating the field right now. So um, thinking of um, Sasha Turner um, on you know, contested bodies and this idea of how to reread amelioration in the British Empire as a story about how women's bodies are going to be controlled. That sort of echoes the way that Jennifer Morgan did this work for the um, British Caribbean and the, and the, the colonial South, you know, and asked the same question about what is the concept of a productive black woman's body do to you know, reframe the ways that we understand the institution of slavery. Sasha Turner's work does that for the sort of the eve of freedom and this idea of a kinder, gentler enslavement that the British were pushing um, between say roughly 1807 and um, 1823. Um, I think you know, the, the work that's just about to come out from um, Jessica Johnson, like in a minute or two is another sort of important read of, you know, kind of this question of how, you know, intimacy becomes that site of practiced freedom. Um, what does it mean to, you know, both, you know, kind of use one's body um, in a way to protect one's body, but also to use, to protect one's body sometimes at the expense of other <laughs> of other bodies, right? Because these some of the women that she's tracing are women who have access to the labor of enslaved women in their assertion of their, you know, freedoms. Um, you know, so the, I think some of this new work, um, Marisa Fuentes on archive and this question of how to, to read violence um, into and out of um, the story, right? I think We've got so many interesting and important um, sort of, co of emerging conversations that are happening about, um, you know, how, at least for the slavery side of things, right? And I think with freedom, we still need some more stories that are strictly um, women-centric. I would say I've always <laughs> sort of chastised myself because I spent so much time in graduate school saying, I really hate the chapter on women model. And then my book, as much as I tried to pay attention to women, there was so much stuff with one specific set of archives that ended up creating a chapter on women. And I didn't, I mean, I'm hoping that when people read, they don't see the women only in that chapter, but there's no way not to put that aside. Is the, the chapter I'm talking about is about a specific kind of violence that is created in this intersection of how to perform freedom, how to deal with the sort of the church as a sort of quasi state in the British Caribbean after slavery, and this sort of um, the, the kinds of everyday, um, you know, forms of intimacy and household formation that are intruded upon when the church says, hey, in order to be participant in the kind of, um, you know, public iteration of freedom that we are trying to generate in this space, you have to be in a Christian nuclear monogamous household. And so the sort of the stuff that came before the ways in which black people were, you know, either forcefully or at sometimes through their own ingenuity working toward different kinds of family formation had to sort of be blown up. And in many ways, that only meant more violence for women in this process of becoming something like free, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, I, I, feel, I feel like, so that's, you know, kind of, I just named a whole bunch of people and including myself and maybe I stopped there. Mm -hmm. um, Laurent, if you want to jump in, yeah. I mean, I always think of, you know, what's fantastic in Caribbean historiographies, there's just like so much to do. There's so many things, right? To kind of, um, notably around the Haitian, so, and I was thinking about this earlier with our question about, you know, so the generation that fights the Haitian Revolution, there's a huge number of people who are 
enslaved people, you know, who are briefly enslaved, I guess, or briefly captives for about a year in their lives or a year or two, right? Coming from Central Africa, they arrive between 1788 and 1791, and then they carry out this revolution, right? So the, the women and men who have that experience, the idea that slavery defines who they are is, of course, completely an imperial projection, right? But in that story too, the story of what emerges in the Haitian countryside in the 19th century is really a story about kind of gender and family and women's roles and the way in which a kind of new order is constructed, right? As it is a story in other post-emancipation contexts, right? It's about whether it's the story of market women or, and, and a lot of these topics, you know, are kind of known, we know about them in a way, and yet the, what, the extent to which people still need to work through them, um, I mean, as you do in the book, but the question of markets and women throughout the Caribbean and every society, right, like there's so much more that can be done there. Um, I think similarly with indigenous histories, um, you know, whether it's the, you know, the Garifuna histories, which are well, which are where are somewhat well studied, but kind of have a huge impact. Um, all of the stories in the Eastern Caribbean and complexities of it, all of the early history in, in the greater Caribbean, not, I mean, the story of the, these like several hundred Natchez who after 17, in 1729 are shipped to Saint-Domingue and we still don't really know like what happens to them. And there's, so anyway, there's all these kind of in, intra movement, right? So in some, the Caribbean is also part of the broader story of indigenous, the indigenous Americas in ways that, you know, there's a lot more to be done too. So I would say all of that is, you know, things to be written, um, that not, you know, there's good work already, but it's like, there's so much that can be, I think, explored and deepened too. Right, I would raise here Melody Newton's work on yes. indigeneity um, in the Caribbean um, and sort of how the English speaking Caribbean has this, you know, kind of ongoing language of indigeneity sort of layered onto the people who descend from enslaved um, populations, but that's a sort of, that's a particular kind of erasure of what came before. And so she's doing some really interesting work to link the story of, um, you know, Arawak work, um, like Arawak histories. Like for instance, she does this amazing, I've seen her give an amazing paper that I think was sort of the precursor to the book that she's doing now on, um, you know, Indian Warner, um, quote unquote, who was yeah. the, the, the mixed race child of the English governor of, I believe it was Dominica, but there's a connection to Antigua as well. And there's this kind of, that, that story that we all know of, of, you know, sort of the wedding of, um, you know, kind of Indian women in the early Americas as a way in that sort of problematic story. That's something that she sort of plays with to really important effect to talk about, again, kind of how, how states are, established in a quite fragile manner because you know Indian water was supposed to be the British kind of way into a kind of settlement <laughs> he was supposed to be their guy and then he just ends up turning and that long history of indigenous rebellion in Dominica that goes right down to now mm -hmm. um, is part of and sort of the the protected space that you know quote unquote Caribs have right now in Dominica and is part of the story that begins with the problems of the 1600s and the, the very first encounters that I think people like Melanie are teasing out. Um, and I can't wait for that book, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's so, many, there's so many people pushing this story into really important directions. I, I also wanted to say, I feel like there were so many people I wanted to raise in this conversation. <laughs> Vince Brown's new book on tacky, Oh yeah. my goodness, can we, you know, if we talk again about, you know, sort of revolutions that fail, um, would be, you know, the would be wars. Like, I, he used the term dirty war, and I just thought, oh my God, you know, this, it, it, so many things happened for me in that, and this sort of idea that we miss certain things when we look at colonial military history without seeing what was happening in the Caribbean as warfare, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> In, for the British context. Obviously, the Haitian context, there's no question, right? Someone like a John Thornton already established that, you know, long ago, um, with sort of thinking about the African antecedent and how that plays into the revolts that are, that are staged in, you know, what becomes Haiti. And even, again, what you're doing with Guadeloupe in your book, same story, right? But um, the British, have, you know, we, we're getting there in, in the English-speaking Caribbean. And I think you know, Vince's book is so important for that, that kind of conversation as well, too. And I would say even the Arming Slaves volume before it that mm -hmm. Chris Brown and um, Philip Morgan did is great, too, for that, for that, those kinds of conversations, right? 
All right, I've got one big, gigantic last question for you guys. Um, and I, again, I'm going to adapt these questions with apologies to the our wonderful participants and their, you know, these fantastic questions that folks have asked. So this is basically a question about how does the Caribbean fit into a, an early American history or does early America actually fit into a Caribbean history? This is actually, this is a question that, you know, um, gives a nod to the hashtag vast early America. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to take responsibility for that. Well, all right, maybe. But anyway, um, but the question really is like, so how do we think of these things together? Are they part of a whole? Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you are writing, are you thinking from the Caribbean? Do people, th do people misunderstand or misperceive the Caribbean when they're thinking from a North American perspective? Do we go from a geographer's perspective, which says actually the continent of North America includes the Caribbean? So it's actually from a geographer's perspective is one, you know, when it, anyway, so. I mean, as Caribbeanists, we just see North America as like the northern edge of the Caribbean, right? It's just sort of like. Totally fair. Uh, the northern, you know, so there's like northern Haiti is in, is in Boston and, you know, anyway, but there, there is a way in which, but I think that, um, I mean, I've, I have to, to me, I think it's also, of course, it depends on when, right? Um, you know, there's a, there it depends on what period and how you're looking at. Obviously, the big transformation, and this is, you know, Julia Scott and Vincent Brown and others have kind of taught me this over and over again, but obviously, the major point is that when you're moving on water, <laughs> you know, um, the Caribbean is really so, is so much at the center, right? Of, of um, and that really doesn't change. I mean, it sort it begins to change obviously in the 19th century, but fundamentally it's the transformation to a transformation, sorry, to a transportation system that doesn't depend on water to the same extent in the 19th century. Um, but so there is a way in which I think, you know, in terms of the Caribbean, I think is, a, is an incredibly vital place to think from. Um, and I think it, it also can help us move away from the different kinds of theologies that, you know, sometimes early America's history just struggles with about always having to explain the US. Um, and, and there's, you know, the point is, that that's why I mentioned, I began by thinking about these kind of the question of the future, right? Um, we're not, I mean, the, the thing is not over, right? You know, so whatever configuration, the, the world's configurations are gonna keep shifting, right? And so ex we're, the, maybe the job isn't to explain what the United States configuration is in right now, right? I think for indigenous histories that certainly, you know, I've had a conversation recently with Juliana Barr who sort of made that point, right? From indigenous perspectives, it's not like their story is over now, right? There are other futures that are yet to be written in which, you know, territory or control over territory may well be reestablished and reasserted in different ways, right? Um, so anyway, I guess that's what I would say too, is that the kind of, um, but for me, I do think that to, to some extent, to, to, to collectively have this conversation of how do we escape the burdens of, of a kind of nationalist 19th century historiography that still kind of haunts us, um, at least I think haunts North America, certainly haunts France um, and England, you know. So, and I do think maybe the Caribbean in that sense maybe might be a place to, to think from. Um, I would also just widen that out to say too that we can be questioning the sort of the uses of configurations like the Atlantic um, and the ways that some of that both, some of the work that both, you know, kind of thinks with Atlantic and also pushes against and questions the uses of it um, mm -hmm. are helpful for expanding beyond the sort of the question of what fits where. Um, so for, you know, and I, and I, I very much, I'm very much thinking right now about Jessica Krug's work, which is totally not in the Caribbean exactly, but it sort of is in its conversation, in the conversation that she's building between, you know, sort of Angola and um, Brazil and the sort of like the the sort of the crossings of different people and ideas around how to be fugitive um, and continuously you know sort of recede from you is I think important mm -hmm. and is something kind of tied to this longer history that goes you know kind of back to a Gilroy and even beyond that um, the, 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 the sorts of ways in which, again, that movement on water means that there are people who are always shifting and never really tied to a place. And in many ways, this idea of how, how one enters the archive is very much about sort of colonial formality um, and, you know, violence, right? And so there's a whole set of people who aren't even in it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking of Krug's phrase where she says, we have to celebrate that. 
yeah. that there's something really important about thinking through fugitivity and the ways that we're escaping this, the sort of the stuff of, you know, because sometimes the boundaries around place, the sort of the labels of even a, a vast, when we, even as we try to make something bigger and capacious and expansive, so a vast early America and Atlantic, sometimes we're still looking at different ways to contain and categorize violence. So mm -hmm. how do we get, you know, how do we think through these categories, but also always challenge them? And I feel like, you know, the, rea the sort of, even thinking about like how people, how people are moving and sort of grounding the story in people as opposed to place sometimes gets you to think more expansively about what these places do or don't mean. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like I'm, you know, I'm trying to, to I think I'm always, you know, sort of interested in what ordinary folks are doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for me, that, that means that, you know, an ordinary person who's put on a boat from one place ends up in another, starts out maybe in a Senegambia, ends up, you know, in, you know, a Caribbean estate, but then that Caribbean estate holder has like some other property, say in the colonial US South, and then that person moves again, you know? We've got a vast early America, we've got an Atlantic, we've got something else. We may not even know who that person becomes next. <laughs> you know, I think about my colleague at Columbia, Carl Jacoby wrote a book about somebody who, you know, whose fugitivity sent them south, right, from Texas into Mexico, and that his enslavement became, you know, the practice of Hispanification of himself. He became, you know, he became Mexican. <laughs> he went from William Ellis to, you know, Eliseo was his last name all of a sudden. And I think, so I think some of these stories are really about people kind of refashioning themselves um, in their movements. And that to me is the story of just about everywhere that's touched by, you know, by the slave trade. So, you know, there's, I don't, I don't even know how we couldn't be, in, you know, kind of inclusive in effect because we're looking at people whose worlds were, you know, in some ways, both very small and yet very big. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm hoping it made sense because I felt like I was rambling. Love, but I, I love that. I, had a point. I love that. I love that gorgeous construction of worlds that are both very big and very small. Yeah. Um, when you work on a small island, it's sort of what you're always dealing with. I know. I always, I think both of us had that, like when I was like, you need to study Guadalupe. People were like, where, what is Right. <laughs> I don't know, it's actually exactly the center. Where? <laughs> that was my childhood in the Bronx, you know, telling people, oh, my family's from Antigua. What? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> or did you say Montego Bay? You know? <laughs> All right, I've got one last thing to ask you both. And this is, this is literally, I, you go you, one sentence and then we're we're going to let people go have their suppers and I'm going to let my kids come back into the dining room here and have theirs. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my dining room here, everyone. Um, so this question, which is a wonderful one, is um, do you think about fiction? Is fiction important for you? Oh, I know, exactly. And right, exactly. And so do you have one sentence that you can say something about fiction that is powerful and important to you um, in a Caribbean context? I mean, for me, my main historiography of my for my book was essentially Alejo Carpentier and Daniel Maximin, two novelists who had written the most detailed things about the thing that I was writing about, you know, more than an historian. And and the fact those novels opened up my imagination. They enabled me when I went to the archives, I was able to do the work I did partly because of those novels. You know, so they really and I I mean I tell my students all the time to read novels when they're writing their dissertations. I think um, we need to think about plot and character and narrative and these and pacing so that we can write history that reaches people and that affects the world that we're in, you know, too. So there's yeah. both, <laughs> yes, but there, both of those, you know, and I mean, we're lucky in the Caribbean because novelists are obsessed with history, you know, Completely. every, like not every novel, but so many novels, you know, even when they're not about history, they're kind of, and so I, I, for me, that's been absolutely fundamental from the beginning. Um, and I think for many people, and I think that that's kind of, that does help, I think, a lot. And, and I think it helps us as writers and as thinkers. Um, and the, whole, the way that they, the, the novel Texaco by Patrick Shamazur that I teach as the textbook. When I teach Caribbean history, I either use Omeros by Walcott or Texaco as like the textbook, you know? 
because they they deal with archives and and all these kinds of historical questions so beautifully so anyway i could go on and on but I, but definitely an enthusiastic yes uh to that <laughs> second that um there's so much first of all i've been trying forever um but we're never on campus at the same time for myself and kyle mcglover to teach a course on caribbean history through caribbean literature mm. if you're watching kayama hello <laughs> but i'm also not teaching this year yeah. So there's that. Um, but, you know, maybe sometime soon. But the point is that the novelists get it so right. They get the archive. They do the things that we can't do as historians sometimes because they can just go so far beyond and yet still create the stories that, you know, make so much sense. I mean, I'm just thinking here, I, I just read Nothing's Matt by Erna Broadburg, which is incredible, and somehow weaves in the Marat Bay Rebellion and, you know, the sort of the move to Panama of West Indians, um, you know, in this case, Jamaicans, um, in such a beautiful fashion that's a story about women in a family and learning how to be a family and tracing family roots. Um, I think about Evelyn Trio, who is, you know, Michelle Rock Trio's sister and the infamous Rosalie. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. If you want to read a, a story about the Haitian Revolution, that's a story to read, right? But there's so many beautiful work. I think about Jamaica Kincaid, that's, you know, I, it's basically all over what I do <laughs> in a way. Um, you know, there's so many novelists and in particular women novelists for me, that just get the Caribbean, you know, Black women novelists telling the story of, of, of Black womanhood through history is, you know, sort of, they, they, they do everything that we historians, you know, in some ways are just trying to catch up with. So, yes. So can I, so I can, can I put you both on the spot and say, um, can I ask, can I email you and ask you to send a couple of these suggestions to add to your suggested reading list that we can put on the website? Absolutely. I mean, I, I kept a list, but, um, but that would be amazing. I am confident people would love that. I, I know that many of these novels are important to people and they're resonant and people are, um, know and have read some of these, but not all of them. And they'd love to know actually um, what's important to you. So I want to thank you both for this incredible conversation. It's really rich and exciting and um, it's just really wonderful and rewarding to see you. And if, if all 170 of us were in a room together, we'd all be doing this for you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, just wonderful to see you. Okay, thank you both. Be well, be safe. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.